As a scientist, you mentioned that the current landscape of biotechnology in medicine and agriculture, can you expand on where we are right now? Well, it's actually a really good time. For many years, biotechnology has been a little bit um, looked at skeptically in the areas of medicine and especially in agriculture. But we're seeing the front edge of innovations really reaching the uh, people it was intended to reach. So we all know about the large agricultural farms in the North America, South America, uh, some other places in the world that use biotechnology for corn and soy and large agronomic crops. But now we're seeing things like vitamin enhanced rice reach the people of the Philippines. Uh, a new salmon is now on the market in North America. And uh, in medicine, it's it's amazing what's going on. Uh, there are people alive today who have biotech innovations, such as uh, reversing sickle cell disease. And that momentum is only accelerating in areas like cancer, Alzheimer's, and other major diseases. I'd like to hear your thoughts about uh, certified organic food, the use of synthetic pe uh, pesticides and fertilizers, and how both differ. Sure, this is really important because when we talk about organic production, we're talking about the use of non-synthetic inputs. So you can use uh, nitrogen. It just can't come from uh, fossil fuel sources like uh, natural gas, That uh, where, where natural gas is confined with uh, atmospheric gas to create nitrogen that can be used on the farm. Uh, you can get nitrogen from uh, compost. You can get nitrogen from breaking down other products. Uh, so that's the big difference. The plant doesn't know if it comes from one source or the other. The other place where we talk about differences between organic production and uh, the conventional production is in other inputs like insecticides uh, or other pesticides. Organic cultivation can use pesticides and can use uh, fungicides, but they have to be natural compounds. So you have to use things like copper. You have to use things like uh, spinosad, other naturally occurring toxins that can limit the growth of bacteria and fungus uh, or insects. Uh, in synthetic uh, conventional biology, you can or synthetic farming or synthetic uh, products. You can use conventional in conventional farming. You can use synthetic products uh, that are more effective on a much smaller scale. So it's a really difficult. Uh, challenge for me to think about as a scientist, that you have very <clears throat> effective ways that are synthetic, that are very uh, low input, you know, maybe a few uh, milliliters per acre, whereas something like copper, you may apply at kilograms per acre. So it, it's, it, for me, uh, I understand the interest. I understand the idea of only natural toxins are better. Um, I, I, it still is something we have to look at very carefully on a per input basis. What is the different chemistry? Where does it go? How does it affect our bodies? And what about the nutritional value between both? Well, that we've looked a lot at this and there's a lot of work that's been done here. And when you look across the board, the nutritional value is almost identical between the two. The one thing that we see consistently coming up higher in organic products is that you do see higher levels of different polyphenols and other antioxidant compounds that typically are associated with plant stress. So plants that maybe are having uh, some insect pressure or fungal pressure may exist, may exert a little bit higher pressure on these particular types of uh, uh, compounds. But in general, it depends a lot more on, it isn't whether you use natural or synthetic compounds that change the um, uh, nutrition quality of the plants. What it mostly is, is, is your farmer fertilizing? Is the farmer using adequate water? Are you protecting from pests and pathogens? Are you using the right genetics? You know the right varieties that give you the uh, that give you the correct or give you higher amounts of these vitamins in the plant products. Um, in general, we live in the best of times in terms of uh, fruit and vegetable production and animal production. Uh, so everything is, is really abundant and diverse and uh, significant nutrition can be found. What about the taste between non-organic and organic? It's clearly like completely different worlds. What's the difference there? Yeah, well, the big difference there may be in where you're getting it from. And that when you're harvesting things, when you have organic farmers who are typically producing, um, are you buying this from a local source potentially? Yes. 
Yeah, so you're getting something that was pulled out of the farm probably this week, or something that's farmed conventionally on a larger farm, maybe coming from uh, pretty far away. And it's that post-harvest quality that makes a difference. Um, smaller farmers, organic farmers, or small farmers like my wife, um, we can choose varieties that can't be grown on the big farms that maybe the large farms have uh, a variety that has a certain resistance to disease that they have to have that they don't want to manage that we can manage for, as a smaller farm. So it much more is a function of genetics and that you can use and the cultivation strategies you have to use them. And also that post-harvest supply chain. If it's going from the farmer to you, it may have a higher quality and better flavors and aromas than something that was harvested two weeks ago you know, in, in the EU, possibly in Morocco or Turkey, brought all the way over to Portugal, that uh, has a significant supply chain. So besides, obviously, like the scale, there are uh, additional notable challenges that certified organic vegetable farmers faced that industrial vegetable farmers do not? Well, uh, the, the big changes, or I'm sorry, so the question is, what are some of the challenges, challenges. they face? Sure. Oh, it's a lot of many challenges because you're, and I have a lot of respect for organic farmers because of the challenges they face. They're uh, having to solve the same problems conventional farmers have only with fewer resources or the fewer um, solutions at their disposal. Um, as I mentioned, my wife farms and we are a conventional farm, but we use a lot of the same organic strategies to handle pests and pathogens. Um, she doesn't want to deal with chemistry or the cost of chem high of conventional products. So we alternate and we'll use an organic solution and then we'll use a conventional solution. The big challenge to organic growers is it's a lot more labor. It takes up more land and space to get the equivalent yield. Uh, yields are generally a little bit lower, but that depends a lot on the farmer, on your experience, on the specific crop that's being grown. Um, some organic farmers do do tremendously well with yield. But if we look overall, it just is a whole lot more work for more product for for the same amount of yield. And that results in higher prices for the consumer. That's why there's a little bit of a difference. What about pest disease resistance between both? Well, that's where uh, where conventional farming sometimes has a little bit of an advantage because you can use varieties that actually have genetic engineering. And genetic engineering is allowed in things like corn, soy, sugar beets, um, some papayas. And when you can use the genetic engineering traits for insect control on corn, for instance, it allows the plant to make the protection against the insects that feed on it. And then you don't have to use any kinds of sprays like conventional farmers on non-transgenic or non-GMO varieties have to use sprays. Organic farmers have to use specific types of sprays to control the earworms and other types of insects that would normally cause organic corn to be attacked by insects. So here's a case where if we're talking about purely um, less input, meaning less insecticide, the GMO corn is a much better choice than either standard conventional or organic because the farmer doesn't have to apply anything in order to have a successful crop. But how does the use of genetically modified seeds in industrialized vegetable production compare to the use of heirloom seeds in certified organic vegetable production? Well, heirloom seeds are, by definition, the seeds that couldn't cut it in commercial production. Okay, so these are older varieties that have ex maybe have excellent flavor, excellent aroma. And I love heirloom tomatoes. I love heirloom vegetables. We grow them. But the problem with them is that you don't get very good yields and they don't stand up to those types of large commercial production standards. And so anything that we produce that's heirloom, we can produce enough for farmer market and and that's all we can produce. I mean, it's not very much, and it's a lot more work. Um, if we can go with modern hybrids in, and so they're not genetically engineered, tomatoes, um, cucumbers, these are not GMO vegetables. Um, they just, they never were. Um, we, have gen we have good hybrids that give us higher yields and give us still excellent flavor, and that's getting better all the time. So the new tr the new trend is how do we get heirloom flavor and heirloom aroma and all those good old uh, traits in modern varieties 
that were really selected for yield, disease resistance, um, color, size, um, all those things, the production traits, shipping. So how do we get the heirloom traits into the modern varieties that have all of those modern production traits? And that's happening now. Can you show some practical ways? Well, I can give you a good example. Um, right here at the University of Florida, we created the Garden Gem Tomato. When I say we, I mean Dr. Harry Klee's sure. lab. And, and this is a great tomato that took a um, heirloom variety and combined it against um, a Florida production tomato. And so you took the best of the production traits with disease resistance and yield and combined them with the superior flavor of something called Malia Rosa. It's a little tiny Italian tomato. And those two together give you a very good tomato that has a lot of the flavor and aroma, but high yield and excellent resistance to disease and much better than the heirloom, but um, and much better flavor and aroma than the industrial tomato. What about the labor practices? The differences between the industrialized vegetable production differ from those used in certified organic vegetable production? Well, organic production, the big difference is, is you can't use any types of synthetics. We touched on this in the beginning. And so you have to resort to other types of uh, ways to control pests, weeds. So when I say pests, we're talking about weeds, we're talking about fungi, bacteria, and insects. And so you need other ways to control those problems. And so you have to do for weeds, it's a lot of manual cultivation. It's a lot of which can be done by hand or by tractor or whatever. Um, you're resorting to um, other strategies such as um, the use of beneficial insects. Like let's say insects that prey on the um, uh, ones you're trying to get rid of. Uh, having more um, uh, other types of um, uh, bacteria that we can use to colonize or fungi that we can use to colonize organic crops. You can spray them with fungal spores from one type of fungus that maybe will take the place of one that might be pathogenic. So there's a lot of really cool strategies that organic farmers have available, that, but they're usually a little more expensive, not as effective, and have to be reapplied. So it costs a little bit more. And so that's why you see a difference in price when you look at that at the market. What role, from your assessment, that science communication and outreach in promoting the economic benefits of certified organic vegetables, both to the public and also helping farmers as well? Sure. Well, the, the big thing is, is talking about what, what important aspects of sustainability organic farming brings to the table. And when you're, when you're asking questions about uh, how, how does it, what are the benefits? And you really focus on the idea that here you're using all natural import, uh, inputs that are able to control uh, pests and pathogens to allow food production. And that's the way that the communication strategy really needs to work. Unfortunately, the communication strategy around most of the organic industry has been, here's why the other stuff is bad. And the problem is that the conventional farming really isn't a problem as much as people would like it, as much as the organic industry would like you to believe. The conventional crops, when you look at them quantitatively for the relative amounts of nutrition or whatever, are about the same and you get higher yields. On, so less space, fewer inputs, um, just synthetic inputs, and you get an equivalent product. So it's it's a really interesting uh, equation for me. I think organic farmers are awesome. I love what they do. And we do learn conventional strategies from organic farming, that the research in organic farming and the new practices people have used have informed the use of things like cover crops and other strategies on conventional farms now that we're borrowing from what we've learned from organic growers. From your experience, do you think there are some areas still lacking and need some more input, like from knowledge base and also capital? Well, as a scientist in agriculture, I'll say yes, just in terms of job security. <laughs> uh, um, I can always tell you a place where we can do better. And that's true with organic and conventional farming. There's always some place that we can uh, do better, whether it's uh, how do we come up with varieties that can be grown locally, something closer to home so we don't have long supply chains. And when you get right down to it, and I mentioned this idea that um, organic and conventional crops both uh, have about the same nutrition. Ultimately, what matters in terms of human nutrition is, does that food item get eaten? And is it available? Is it accessible? 
So those are the big ones for me. In other words, are we creating food that we're wasting? And that's because maybe it had to be shipped too far and didn't didn't last as long. That that's a waste, and then that that needs to be fixed. Um, the way flavors and aromas, if it doesn't taste good, people won't choose it. And so if you're not choosing fruits and vegetables, then you're not getting their benefits, whether they're organic or conventional. And the other big one is that if it costs too much, if people of, of limited means do not have access to fresh fruits and vegetables, then that's a problem too. So how do we make sure that it, it, is, it doesn't get wasted, that it's affordable, and that people like it? That's the best thing agriculture can focus on. How could we focus on finding ways of making it more affordable? And, and that's a really important one. How do we find varieties that have higher yields that can produce um, uh, in different seasons when seasonal fluctuations in price um, uh, cause spikes in cost? Maybe something that could be produced closer to home. Maybe these ideas of uh, vertical farms or indoor farms right there in Lisbon or in, in a major city can mean you would don't have to have the cost of bringing it all the way from South America or from um, areas in Morocco and other areas within uh, Eastern Europe where many crops are produced for the EU. Uh, there's a lot of places, there's a lot of ways that we can save money by shortening supply chains and maybe pass those costs to the consumer. So local production is a key factor here, clearly. Well, it has a place. I don't think that local production will ever sustain a population. Um, and I'm a local producer. My wife is a local producer. Um, I'm a professor, but she does all the work on the farm. And we have great local products that people can enjoy. And a head of lettuce we produce will last in your refrigerator for three weeks, whereas one you purchase in the store might last a few days. It, the local production has a place. But I think the the overall the overall revisions will have to be on a per food item basis. What can we grow best in different places and limit the number of inputs and the cost of production? I think this is really where we're going to go in the future. Okay, just a, a key note from your expertise on functional genomics, photomorphogenesis and small molecule discovery. Can this be applied to other certified organic crops in the future in terms of economic benefits? Well, genomics is a huge area. Genomics is this ability to make decisions on, uh, on crop genetics based upon looking at all of the genes that are there. So what, what, it, what this means in terms of creating new varieties is that someone whose job it is to make the next best tomato or the next most productive cucumber or one that can survive maybe drier areas of the world or wetter areas, whatever, it allows you to pick the best parents by looking at the genomics uh, by looking at the DNA of those individual parent lines and seeing which traits they travel with. And by using um, just standard breeding, mixing the two together, making hybrids, but doing it in an informed way that is much faster than the old way of uh, make crosses based upon our best guesses and see what we get. This idea of genomics assisted breeding can accelerate our ability to produce new varieties for organic or conventional production. And I think that is where the biggest gains are going to be made. So control the environments clearly contributes to sustainable economics here. Well, that remains to be seen. I think in some places, controlled environment agriculture is a, is a, is working. And if you live in a large population center, you can produce on one side of town and sell in the other. But that's the power of having these types of uh, controlled environment or for indoor vertical farms. It's also very good for a limited number of plants like leafy greens. Uh, we don't see this being particularly applicable yet for things like strawberries or blueberries or tomatoes. But I think we're still in the infancy of this discipline. And as we begin to identify new varieties that work in these spaces, you'll see more and more indoor crops coming and more greenhouse and vertical farms uh, uh, starting to pick up momentum. We see it doing very well in the Netherlands. Um, over in Portugal, you're probably getting tomatoes and cucumbers from the Netherlands all the time. 
And I think that that's something that is potentially going to be a growth industry as we get better at it and get better uh, varieties that do better inside those environments. From like a statistical point of view, I'm interested in knowing if there would be a way of comparing, like doing different hypotheses between like crops in the same area. You mean from uh, of of testing different types of varieties inside yes. those areas? Yeah, and I I, th I think that's where that's going, and I'm sure that uh, researchers in your institutions in in Portugal are looking hard at this, because right now the the big trick is how do we come up with new varieties that fit those particular Portuguese niches, uh, those specific uh, environments well, and keeping in mind that environments are changing with the climate. And that we don't see the same opportunities we saw uh, 50 years ago happening now. So being able to breed new varieties is really important. And I think it's great. If you can find varieties that fit into a given area of the country, its individual climate as you move across mountain areas, whatever, uh, that's a really powerful thing to be able to do. And, and something that we see as a trend, I think, throughout the world. We're always experimenting, but what we're trying to do is identify the varieties that already exist for different crops and try them in our space. So if it already produces an excellent fruit, how does it do in our area, which is extremely hot and humid, except um, and, and with some very cold periods uh, that are very short? It has to survive the cold yet thrive in the heat. And so we always are testing and we're looking for new varieties that survive in those areas. And that's just, uh, it's, it's a really fun thing to be able to go to work thinking about how we're going to improve fruits and vegetables and then go home and see how they do in the ground. It's a, yes. it's a really satisfying career. That's cool. About, about career, what advice would you have for a young scientist entering the field? So key areas that they could focus on, they are key important for us as a human species to prosper. Yeah, and then this is a great question. I think that a, a student today, and I tell my students this, the job you have you will take may not have been invented yet. Um, the field is moving so fast, and particular particularly in the areas of biotechnology and how these areas of gene editing are going to be used to remodel the genetics of crops to fit better in organic or conventional production. Right now, they're forbidden in organic production, but I think they'll be accepted soon. And uh, students need to be getting excited about, about chemistry and math and about physics and biology, the basic sciences, and really thinking about how to apply all these disciplines to questions in, uh, bio, in, in, in uh, crop production. Uh, engineering will be huge. How do we use uh, drones and imaging and sensors on the farm? to limit the amount of water or fertilizer or uh, uh, detect pests and pathogens before they become a major problem, maybe just spot treat on tiny parts of a farm. So this idea of engineering is going to be huge. Genetics will be huge. And I think it's a very good future for agriculture as long as we keep all tools on the table so that farmers and folks in technology have access to them. But that's a key area, not uh, avoiding waste using technology and also looking for problems that could be avoided by like having more data points. Yeah, and, and it's huge. Data is a, is a huge driver going forward. And I think folks in computational biology, uh, people who have good computer skills and are good at programming, they definitely will have a place in modern food production going forward. 